Nada, good to see you again. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for having me here. So, Nada Rad, back after our fantastic conversation about uh, Pinbox 7. Uh, but now we're talking about something else, something that is um, much more his own creation rather than collaborating with a whole team. Nada collaborated with Frank Turley to create P3 Express. And we've already done a video with Frank talking about how you can use P3 Express really to start off in project management. But I wanted to go deeper and tap into Nada's perspective on what sort of project and what sort of project management P3 Express is best suited to. Because without a doubt, it is a great methodology. There's a lot of stuff there. And because it's free, it's going to have a lot of appeal. But as we all know, a big part of modern project management is making a sound selection of your project approach. That's what a large chunk of Pinbox 7 was about. That's a large element of Nada's thinking and one with which I'm entirely in sympathy. So let's find out from Nada who P3 Express is designed for and what projects it is best able to use. So welcome to the show, Nada. Thank you. So can I start with the obvious question, which I guess some people will be thinking, which is, why do we need another project management methodology? We've got loads of them mm. already, haven't we? Do we? Well, <laughs> we've, got, <laughs> well, we've got a whole slew of agile approaches. We've got Prince, we've got Pinbox, we've got the APM. Some of them you might not call methodologies, but they're, they're kind of ways of doing projects, I guess. Yeah, we do have resources, but I... I think we need to have a lot more. We need to have diversity in the system. People need to have choices. Uh, and as you said, not all of them are methodologies. So they are not something they can use in their projects in a step-by-step -step approach and get somewhere. It's mm. more like a guide, like the PEMBAC guide. Mm. Um, but it comes to agile projects, they do have a lot more. But especially for predictive projects, we we really need a lot more than that, more than what we have right now. But mm -hmm. uh, the main reason for creating P3 Express was that uh, we started thinking about the fact that we all know it's a sad fact that most people don't have a structured project management approach. They just uh, run their projects intuitively without a predefined the structure. They have to reinvent the wheel all the time. They have to do trial and errors. They lose a lot of money. They lose a lot of their mental energy, the project managers, and a lot more. But on the other hand, it does. it's not because they are not interested in having a structure, the approach. They are. They do go take courses, read books, and a lot more. But at the end, you see that most of them cannot use those things. And the, the standard approach is to just blame them or blame the higher managers in the organization saying that they are not supporting the projects properly. But when it happens so much to so many people, then I believe that we have to stop blaming those people. We have to stop blaming ourselves as the sub-community in the project management community for those people who are more involved in the standards. Mm -hmm. What I mean is that what we have created, uh, while those things are really helpful and interesting, they are not everything that the project managers need. Mm. And my usual example is uh, to imagine all the people who use Excel or some other type of a spreadsheet for all types of work. Now imagine that at one point in time, we take away Excel, we don't give them that anymore, and give them a programming language instead, Python or something else, for example. What happens? Just imagine that day. You don't have Excel anymore, and instead of that, you have a programming language. When you think about it, anything you can do with Excel, 
you can do with a programming language. And there are a lot of things you can do with a programming language that is not so doable with Excel, even though it seems to be Turing complete, but that's a different problem. But anyway, it's a lot more flexible and more powerful, but that doesn't make it a better option for people. It's an option we need for some people who are programmers, who are developers, or hobbyists who like to spend some of their time programming, like myself, but not for all people. In the project management community, I believe that the sources that we have for project managers are more like programming languages. They are really great, they are powerful and flexible but too complicated for most people. What we need to have in the project management community is something like Excel. And Petri Express is trying to be that type of answer. Just so like you're that, taking that's a, the way it exists. So you're taking a subset of all the things you could do and all the things you could, all the ways you could apply your knowledge if you learn the basics of project management from the ground up and finding a subset that works for whatever domains you, you're going to tell us it's designed for. The subset that is absolutely essential for projects, mm -hmm. not everything else that is very interesting or really helpful. Anything that is not absolutely 100% essential is removed. And okay. when you think about it, that's the problem that we have when people start learning the Pemba guide or Princeton and so on. They go on, they start enjoying it because they see that some of their questions are answered. There are mm. some solutions, but then after a while they see that there are a lot more problems that they have that they didn't even think about that. And after a while they don't even know where to start. Yeah. And sooner or later they just give up. Yeah. The problem is that it we try to cover 100% of the possible benefits of project management, it would be really complicated. But mm. if we just aim for the 80%, then it becomes really easier, a lot easier. So when we look at the, the P3 Express diagram, there's that master diagram, which draws people in, or certainly draws me in, because there's all those different points to explore. Or it's got a, a clear pattern to it, but it does kind of remind us, or it, do, it does remind me of Scrum, the, the, the classic pictures of Scrum with the, the nested loops. So is P3 Express just a generic agile methodology then? That, that's a common thing to, to hear. Uh, and the simple answer is mm, not really, <laughs> because, uh, in Agile, we do have iterations, but those iterations are for the product. We yeah. do also have iterations for the management processes, but what makes it really Agile, adaptive, is when you iterate in your product. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case with P3 Express. You can iterate in your product if you want, but what, it, what we have there, all those circles, we have different types of cycle in P3 Express, those are about the management processes, not the delivery processes. Uh, and well, the first thing is to consider these different levels, the management layer and the delivery layer. Uh, if you want to have an adaptive system with incremental delivery and iterative development, then your management layer should have a similar approach. It also needs to have cycles. Mm. But if you have a predictive system, it can have either of them, either the cycles or a linear approach. And our choice was to go with cycles because that makes it easier to manage but because you keep repeating the same thing. Mm. When you repeat, it becomes a routine for you. You don't have to think about it all the time. That's one reason. And the other reason is that we wanted it to be compatible with both approaches. Mm. And lastly, it's not so uncommon to have cycles. Uh, 
in Petri Express, those cycles are really visible. You can not avoid seeing them. Yeah. They are just there. But when you think about Prince 2, for example, does it have cycles? We don't see cycles, but it does have cycles, really. Yeah. And it's part of it. There's managed by stages in Prince 2 that yeah. says you must have those cycles. They're just not visible. Yeah. With the Pemba guide, the old versions, we had both of them, really. There was the linear type of managing, but you also had the option to have multiple phases and repeat the same cycle for them. Or from another perspective, there was the option to have rolling wave planning, which yeah. also creates some type of cycle. So what I mean is that cycles are not really limited to agile projects. It's a choice that we can have in either of them. Yeah. And, and even at the simplest level, we have cycles for reporting, we have cycles for risk management. Mm -hmm. And I, and I like yeah, that. And, yeah. you know, for many years, I thought, you know, the agile, agile practitioners didn't invent iterations. They didn't invent incrementalism. We've had that in project management. They've just brought it to the forefront. So I like this. So when you design P3 Express, you, you made the comment earlier that um, all it contains is what is absolutely essential and, and therefore, you know, it might not deal with every project because some projects need some extra stuff, but maybe 80%, I think was the figure you put on it. So when you were thinking about what to include, what not to include, who were you thinking of? What kind of projects, what kind of project managers are bang in the sweet spot for using and applying P3 Express successfully? Okay. Well, first, the 80% that I said was not exactly 80%. It was no, I know. Uh, a reference to the 80-20 rule. Most yeah, of, of course. Uh, <laughs> I, also, I'm not going to hold you to it. I'm not going to do a yeah, survey yeah, of people yeah. who have tried it and, and, and prove that it's actually 78.3. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, even for, for that 80-20 rule, yeah. uh, there are two different uh, subjects for it. Here. One is that we don't try to cover every type of project, but the most common types of project, that's one way we can simplify it. And the other thing is that even in those projects, we don't try to cover 100% of the possible benefits of a structured project management system. Yeah, We go for the 80% of the benefits that may be achievable by 20% of the effort. That's the yeah. idea here. So both of those exist there. Uh, for the audience, uh, it is compatible both with predictive and adaptive systems, mm -hmm. uh, but our main and primary audience was the predictive projects. Right. And the reason for that is that we believe that there has been less help in that area the past mm -hmm. 20 years or something. In the adaptive systems, people had access to a lot more resources, especially mm. in the recent years. So our, our audience, primary audience was people who, who work in predictive projects, but still it's uh, also compatible with adaptive projects. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is about the size of the project. And when I say size, it's mainly about the number of people involved in it, not the cost of the project yeah uh, in here our primary target is a small and medium projects mm. not large projects and when you think about that the, there's no exact number that you can give because for example in, in a in a process plan project if you have 500 people then it's a medium size project, not so yeah. big, and it can be useful. But if there's an IT project and you have 500 people, then it's a really large project. It would be yeah. So um, for a small and medium sized projects, depending on the na nature of the project, that's our target audience. But for larger projects, it's not designed for them but sometimes the choice is not between 
T3 Express and something that is designed for that type of project. Sometimes the choice is between P3 Express and not having any structured approach at all. In that yeah. case, I think P3 Express can still help them in those yeah. projects. Yeah. Not perfectly, yeah. but it helps. Yeah. The other thing is about how critical the project is. There are some really critical, life-sensitive projects out there, yeah. and they really need to have their own special approach to project management and to everything else, which is obviously not the subject here. It is yeah. for normal projects without the special considerations. But again, if the choice is between having a minimalist, simple system and nothing at all, still having that simple system is a better yeah. choice. Yeah, I, I must admit, when I looked through it, it seemed to me that this was perfectly suited in my mind, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, for those kind of business projects that tend to be led by people who don't see themselves as project managers. It's not their ambition to be a full-time project manager, to study project management, to become a PMP or to learn prints, but they do need to deliver their business project accountably uh, within their business culture. And, and for those kind of project managers, as you say, they might have no methodology at all uh, if, they were, if, if P3 Express isn't available. It, it seems to me that's going to be very powerful for those kinds of projects and project managers. Yes, that's the main audience for us. Mm. Some people call them accidental project managers, <laughs> yeah. some other name. But, uh, you know, we can imagine a spectrum. Those people yeah. are in one side of the spectrum and there are many of them. In the middle, we have expert project managers. And then there's another side, and that's for people who are experts in project management processes. Those are not our audience, not the project yeah. management process experts. Uh, our target audience is normal project managers or accidental project managers who have to deal with day-to-day -day work of the project, with all the problems, conflicts, people have problems with each other negotiations, motivation, and besides all of them, they need to have a system to make it easier for them. Yeah. And they don't want to build the whole system. No. Yeah. The computer that I have right now here besides me, I've assembled everything. I've even adjusted some of the things. This is not something you can expect from everyone who uses a computer. Yeah. We shouldn't expect it. And that's the same with project management. We don't yes. want everyone to open the system, be able to open it, make changes without destroying it. Their main mm -hmm. job is not to create that process. The main job is to run the project. It's great yeah. if, if they can create it, but we cannot really expect that. Yeah. One of the messages I give people when I train them, and I do train a lot of people, like you say, accidental project managers, project managers at the start of their career, people who are going to be managing small to medium-sized projects. But I always emphasize the need to be prepared to scale the level of formality of your project, the amount of documentation you use, um, to that. And when I look at P3 Express, I see it's very, very slim in terms of its documentation requirements, which I know will be very, very welcome to a lot of, uh, a lot of business people. If I've got it right, there are, I think, four key documents within P3 Express. But I'd also like you to address the question of how one might scale P3 Express to meet a range of needs. Is it a fixed methodology or is it scalable in, in, in some way? You can adjust it of course, like everything mm -hmm. else. But the, the whole idea is to create the bare minimum that you really, really need to have, something that you cannot afford to lose in your project. And if you want to go back to the domain of uh, expecting the project manager to tailor to their project all the time, then you will have the same problem. Okay. So on one hand, we want to keep it like this, Hmm. Uh, and 
expect that 80% of the benefits instead of 100%. But then in pattern, then we have this idea of creating different themes for P3 Express. So instead of expecting the project managers to do it themselves, it will be partially tailored version of Prince for different types of uh, projects. There, there are already some people volunteered for doing that for research projects, construction projects, IT projects, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's about the scale. Sometimes it's about the application area. Yeah. And that's where they even combine it with some of the things that may not be 100% in the management layer, but if you have them, it will make your management a lot easier. Right. And uh, that's what we have in mind at the moment. And for the documents, it's the same thing that I mentioned before. We just try to keep the most important things, the things that we cannot imagine a proper project without those. Yeah. And the end result was those four documents. And even for them, we didn't try to be compatible with everything else that is out there. Yeah. Not at all. Because, well, for many of us who have experience in different types of, for example, uh, IT projects, we know how difficult it is to, to deal with legacy code. That's the same mm -hmm. here. We have a lot of legacy in project management. For example, uh, the work breakdown is structure. Mm. It's a concept that we usually need in projects. But most people don't get it right. They're... Work breakdown structure is supposed to be based on deliverables, on the building elements of the product, but it's usually work-based. And well, when you think about it, it's in the name. We're calling it work breakdown <laughs> structure. So one of my old suggestions uh, for the PMBOK guide before the seventh edition was to change the name from work breakdown structure to something like project breakdown structure. It makes I'm for that. Sense. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> in, in Petri Express to avoid those types of misunderstanding, we've been very careful with names. And because we didn't want to be compatible with everything that is out there, we just felt free to pick any name we want. So instead of saying uh, work breakdown and structure, we started thinking, what is it supposed to be? It's supposed to be a set of deliverables, a hierarchy of deliverables. And hierarchy may be a little bit too much, may sound complicated. And then at the end, we decided to call it a deliverable map. Yeah. I really like the name. It's a map of the deliverables in the project. Yeah. When you call it like this, it's very difficult to mistake it for a set of activities in the project. Yes. Um, or for example, for the business case, it's one of those things that people believe they must have in their projects, but they never have properly. They have sometimes a template that they fill in, but it doesn't do anything in the project. Everything that we have here is integrated into everything else, in, into the whole process. It does something. And if we remove one of these elements, we will have a lot of problems everywhere in our process in P3 Express. And what we thought was that uh, a really effective business case cannot be created within the boundaries of the project because it's about the justification of the project. And the justification has a lot to do with everything else that is happening in the organization. Yeah. Serious business cases usually come from the program or portfolio management system, yeah. not in the project management system. In the project management system, we need to have the business case because we want to well, support the other layers. That's one thing. And also make sure that we are moving toward that justification, that goal that we have for the project, for the benefits and so on. Yeah. So uh, we said, okay, when it's like this, let's leave that document called business case to those layers that really own it, not to the project management layer. And instead of that, we have one piece, one section 
in another document called project description, where mm -hmm. the project manager is supposed to mention what the core of the business case is. Mm -hmm. And that's because we believe that that's the main thing that we work with during the project. So remind us every once in a while, and then when we want to make important decisions, we want to take a look and make sure that it's compatible with that and so on. When it came to the other things like the registers, that's mm. one of the things that people are always afraid of. They have issue registers and risk registers and change logs and so on. And many of them are not functional. They are not really, really functional. They usually spend some time, especially at the beginning of the project, recording some items. Some of them may not even be well formed. And that's because they don't have the whole process in mind. They are not trying to satisfy a purpose, but they are trying to satisfy an artifact. Mm. So we worked a lot on that part. And it was a, something that was very strange for a lot of people, especially the project management process experts. They find it very strange what we've done. What we've done was that we tried to unify all of those things, the risks, the issues, these two things, people always confuse them and mm -hmm. mix them up. Uh, the change requests, the lessons learned, and the improvement plans. Yeah. And we found a simple formula using which we can describe all of them in a well-formed uh, way and a process that can be in common for all of them. Mm. And therefore, we could put all of them into one register. Yeah. And when it came to the naming, uh, the idea was, okay, what's the main thing we want to do with all of these? What's the single thing that is in common for all? It's the fact that we want to follow up on them. We want to make sure that they are not forgotten. We mm -hmm. do something about them and we go on until those things are closed. So the name became the follow-up register. Yeah. We don't even separate them in that register. We don't separate them based on uh, their nature, if they are a risk or an issue or something else. Just keep it simple. As long as you make sure that you're following up on them with that common similar process, that's okay. Don't care if it's a risk or an issue. We will leave that to the project management process experts. Yeah. I like that a lot because, yeah, until I got my head around that, I thought, where's the risk register? Like, maybe yeah. I am that project management process expert. But because I, I've spent a career of telling people that the, the one document they need to keep because of the, their responsibility, their duty to the, whoever they're doing the project for is to, to be mindful of, of, of their reputation, of their money, of their resources. And so they've got to, got to show that they are diligently thinking about risk and, and acting on it. But bringing all of it together makes a lot of sense. I, I have always worked with a consolidated risk and issue log because uh, to me, it's just a matter of percentages. An issue is 100% likely. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just yeah. that, you know, it is just a risk with, a, with, with certainty instead of uncertainty. Um, and I like that. And, I've, and I've, you know, I know some people have a RAID log, which includes actions and decisions alongside um, uh, risks and issues. Uh, but the expanding it out and knowing that there's all these things you have to follow up on, you have to keep in mind and revisit in the cycles is i think inspired i, I think that's that's great Thank so you. you know that we uh we really love removing things but this yeah. one seems like something we've added that doesn't exist in a lot of other yeah. places uh that's because we thought it would be very helpful for people to have um I imagine you can show the process at this yes. point when you're editing yeah. the video. <laughs> at the end of our cycles, we have uh, activities to evaluate stakeholder satisfaction. And that's both for internal stakeholders and external, external yeah. stakeholders. 
we do it every month. So that that's really important, and uh, all the evaluations are anonymous because we want people to be comfortable telling us if there's a problem, we want to know as soon as possible. Mm. And the health register is a place where we record the results of that. And then we have another activity where we bring the team members together. We see the results of the last evaluation, both for the internal team members and the external stakeholders. And we ask them to come up with some improvement plans for the project. Yeah. That's one of the things. The other thing is that uh, we also have this concept of peer review in, in the process. The idea is that at certain times, and it repeats again, it's iterative, but iterative yeah. for the process, for a management process, not for the product. Uh, at, uh, at certain points in the cycle, the project manager is supposed to go to another person in the organization, another project manager, and ask them to come and check what they've done during the cycle or during the, that section of activities. And just audit them, tell them, peer review, that's the friendlier name. That's friendlier yeah. than audit. And we think this is really helpful. Mm. Um, almost necessary because when you do that, you're sharing experiences in the whole organization. It's not about having isolated projects, but it's about having project managers and other people in the project management team to learn from each other. And this is yeah. a great opportunity. First, because you learn from each other. And the other thing is that when you do something yourself, you're so close to the work that sometimes there are mistakes, obvious mistakes that you cannot see. Mm. But when you bring someone else and a colleague from the organization, they can find it out and tell you about it, which is great. And yeah. by the way, this is obviously not something we've discovered. It's a really common thing in many domains. Yeah. But we are not so used to doing that in project management. We really want to encourage people to do that. Yeah. I think I love the concept because it really takes stakeholder engagement to the limit. I, I did a video recently where I pointed out that we should actually have a stakeholder listening plan as part of our stakeholder engage a wider stakeholder engagement plan. And that's really what this is. It, it is a, a systematic approach to finding out what your stakeholders think and then acting on it. And I like that. We've gone through a lot of P3 Express. Um, is there any other elements that you'd like to highlight? We've covered the things that I, I've, I've wanted to focus on. What about you? Is there any other components or aspects to it that you think mm. uh, you're particularly proud of or think are particularly useful? Oh. Something that is important for me uh, is that it's not a proprietary concept. It's uh, uh, free in the sense that, well, you don't, we don't charge for it. That's one aspect of being free, but the other is the free from freedom. It's open, it's, it's not proprietary. <laughs> and I believe it's really key, it's important, very important for people who want to adapt, uh, to adopt it, to use it, for trainers especially, because mm -hmm. it makes everything predictable for people. In the license that we've selected, it's Creative Commons. You cannot even revoke the license. You cannot come back after a few months or a few years and say, <laughs> okay, it's not free anymore. Yeah. We cannot do that. You're not allowed to do that. So it will be forever non-proprietary. And the difference is that when you work as a trainer, for example, on a proprietary concept, the IP owner can always prevent you from doing that. And we've had incidents in the past. There was an exact point in time after which all the videos about this uh, specific resource was removed from Udemy because the yeah. new policy in that organization was that only the accredited training organizations can yeah. provide training in that area. Yeah. And when you think about it, uh, you have to spend three, four, 
five months creating the course as a trainer. I've spent, for example, six months creating a single e-learning course. Mm. And you needed to be there and work for many years in order to return on that investment. But if you suddenly lose it, that's horrible. You yeah. cannot do anything about it. And even with the accredited training organizations, the IP owner always has the right to say that you're not accredited anymore. Yeah. So again, you've invested a lot and most of the trainers and uh, are not huge organizations. There are single people or small companies of five or yeah. six people and it's really horrible for them. We've had many incidents like that before, but it cannot happen with P3 Express. And I'm very happy about it because I personally really like non-proprietary open and free things. I'm a Linux user, yeah. love open source. I think the other thing that is marvelous about it is if I understood, if I understand the Creative Commons license properly, it means that if I take P3 Express and I see a particular niche where I think with a bit of work, P3 Express could work and I adapt it and I train that specific adaptation, I'm free to adapt it and use it as I see fit. I, I don't have to conform to the precise way that you've articulated it and still, you know, I, I can move away from that. Is, uh, that's correct, is it? There are different types of Creative Commons license. But right. the one that we've selected is one that is really flexible and it does allow what you just said. Yeah. So you can uh, pick P3 Express and create a new version of it that is for a specific industry and start selling it. That's okay. Actually, okay. in the uh, first version, we had uh, this other type of Creative Commons license where people who use it and make changes have to provide the output with the same license as we do, meaning that it has to be free and open for everyone. But then we realized that it's not as good as we thought it would be because then what we are saying is that if you're a trainer and you create your own content, then you have to provide it to all trainers, but that doesn't work properly. Yeah. So in the new license, we don't have any conditions like that. You're free to create something based on Prince uh, P3 Express, <laughs> yeah, it can be for commercial or non-commercial uh, reasons, and it can be free or non-free, and you can do just yes. anything you want. Yeah, the real value of that is for an organization to adapt P3 Express to its own culture and its own needs and the types of projects, and, and yeah. know that they can continue to adapt it and continue to use it as long as they choose. And I think probably for most of the people watching that this video that's going to be the the freedom that they're going to value most I, I guess we'll have relatively few trainers watching the video but a lot of people working in organizations thinking actually we don't have a we don't have our own methodology we've got a hodgepodge of ideas from a bit of prince and a bit of pmi and a bit of apm and a bit of scrum but here's something coherent we can now adapt that to our use and and get a a methodology that works in our organization and then keep it alive and fresh by building on it as we learn. Yeah. yeah. And That's one of the consequences is that when it's open like this, it, it really belongs to, to the practitioners who use yeah. it. It's not something they borrow or use from another resource. It, they are part of it. And therefore we, gradually see a community forming here mm. in it's been i think only about two months if i'm not wrong uh that we've released the second version which is also so that, that was may 2021 year. i think uh, may, yeah. uh, so during this time we have uh nearly 50 people I think 47 or 48 people who have volunteered to translate the manual into different languages. Right now, uh, I think it's being translated into 14 or 15 languages, which is just amazing. It's great. Yeah. So it'd be, I mean, it will overtake the pinbook if all 47 come 
<laughs> uh, come up with the goods, uh, which is great. As a professional, whether, whether you're a project manager or a manager or a professional in any walk of life, I think volunteering your time either within your professional community or within your wider community, your society, your neighborhood is a brilliant way to build your professional skills and your career because typically when you're volunteering you're encountering a wider set of problems or a completely different set of problems and challenges than you do in your work life and that can yeah. only improve your thinking skills and i know you and i share an interest in critical thinking as a as a, as a topic of, of learning but your thinking skills your flexibility your your ideas so yeah volunteering is something um, anyone watching this should be considering as part of their portfolio of activities um, Nada, we, we, we're coming to the end, but the one thing we haven't told people is if they get if they're as excited as you and I are about P3 Express, how can they actually find out more about it? How can they understand how the methodology works and perhaps uh, getting involved in the community that you're starting to build? Okay, so there's a website, and I imagine the URL is here on the page somewhere. Yeah, down there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it'll be uh, there'll be a clickable link in the description as always. Okay, great. So um, when you go to the website, there's the online manual, and there's also a PDF version that people can download. Uh, right now, that's the main source for learning P3 Express. Yeah, uh, it's not a huge document because. So the whole thing is simple. Yeah. In addition to that, we are also working on uh, uh, an e-learning course for P3 Express. Great. And yeah, the EC has, the European uh, Commission has sponsored that. They are paying for all the costs so that it can be free. Although yeah. don't tell them, but we wanted it to be free anyway, but now they are also paying the yeah. costs, which is great. But it's just the Erasmus uh, program, which is all about yeah. international cooperation. And, and so I think it's the right place for that to come from. When it comes to the e-learning course, we have something really, really brave as the course. It's uh, not common at all, but it's not the typical e-learning course that you mm -hmm. see everywhere. Uh, it, the, the whole course is an interactive story and the learner becomes the main character in the story who's a project manager yeah. and they go through the story, they make decisions and based on the decisions they make, they go to different paths and yeah. they receive feedback from their environment and based on the, that feedback, they learn P3 Express, which I think will be a great way of learning the, the thing i love about what is there on the existing website is that it's not a flat manual it's not just a load of text it is interactive you you've got this marvelous interactive navigation tool and you then click on click on the, the part of the process that you want to learn about and and you're taken to the description of it and i think that that's that's brilliant i think it you're the innovation that you and Frank have, have shown in creating not just a fantastic resource, but finding a way to teach it is, is brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So for those of your audience who are interested, you can subscribe to the newsletter. And yeah. uh, we always send emails every, every other month or so and tell everyone about the new developments in P3 Express. For example, there's this new course, there's this new manual, the new extension or add-on working group, volunteer yeah. opportunities, uh, and so on. Yeah, fantastic. Also, if there are any people interested in translation, we have only 14 languages right now. So yeah. if your language is not among those, please contact yeah. us. And I suppose one of the real great things about this, which we, we haven't mentioned so far, is that if you come from a country where your businesses or even your state institutions aren't rich and can't afford to train people in some of the proprietary methodologies that, that cost a lot of money for the training and for the materials. This is, this is perfect for, for those countries. So translators in, in yeah. countries where, where there's a, a need for free access to methodologies. 
Yeah, that's great. That's correct. Uh, but there are uh, that's one important thing to make it more accessible. But the other thing that is also important for us is to be all inclusive. We don't want it to, to be uh, a certain resource that belongs to a certain country or a certain mm -hmm. region. We want it to belong to everyone in the world. And one way of that is to recognize uh, all the languages, all concerns that are local to those regions. And for example, for the course that I told you, mm. uh, I think we spent two days researching to create a list of names for the characters. We only wanted to use unisex names. Yep. And we want those wanted those names to come from as many nationalities and languages and countries as possible. It was an interesting journey. Yeah. In some languages, uh, they don't have unisex names, but we could find some some special ways of managing that. For example, they have yeah. nicknames that are unisex, yeah. so we use the yeah. nicknames. These are the things that you no, know, it goes a little beyond only a process because project management is about working with people we have yeah. to be conscious about these things this is part of that yeah. it's really really helpful i believe yeah well i really do wish you and p3 express well maybe we'll come back together again at some point and review how it's gone and and, and where the, the state of it but for the time being, Nadarad, thank you very much for telling us all about P3 Express and also sharing some real insights into the depth of thinking that you've, you've exercised in creating this new methodology. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Please do give us a thumbs up if you like this video. I'll be creating loads more great project management content, so please subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of it. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video.